never had friends. By age 10, I'd already lived seven years with no memory of my mother and three years without my father due to his incarceration. I never stayed anywhere long enough to develop meaningful friendships. By age 10, I'd already survived five serious life-threatening experiences. Asthma, head trauma, near drowning, swallowed snake poisoning, and suffered a severe form of the flu. Nested within unsafe and uncertain circumstances coupled with a deeply wounded and dysfunctional family. Finding quality friendships was critical for my survival. In those moments when despair was too bitter to breathe air, it was strangers that bestowed upon me a tremendous amount of character, concern, and care. I witnessed a special kind of friendship from children who were born in crime-infested, impoverished, isolated, drug-polluted, concrete cages called the housing projects. We survived by the power of our friendship and the truth in our art. But before I tell you the story of my friends, I want to talk to you a bit about trauma. The leading causes of death have been linked to adverse childhood experiences, also known as ACEs. I was on the brink of a doctoral degree when I learned that my A score was 10. 10 crushing aces from chronic domestic violence to my late stepmother French kissing me and my brothers before we went to elementary school. We were defined by trauma and oppression. It shaped the depth of our depressions, the passion in our affections and the truth in our expression. Ashamed to speak so we nourish each other's courage to express ourselves through artistic confessions. The thing you need to know about our traumas, we get it from our mamas. My ancestors, my kinfolks, were the victims of American slavery, genocide, apartheid, and generations of oppression. We are intimately connected to these atrocities, consciously or unconsciously. My grandfather was among the first generations to be born free. My very last name, Johnson, is a slave name. It is not an African name, but the name that commemorates those who brutalized my forefathers. Many things remain that we learned from slave masters, such as some parenting practices. Go on, get that swatch. Whip his backside with a belt. Boy, sit down and shut up. I'm going to beat your Baha. Don't you touch that. I'm going to beat you. Stop all that crying. Stop all that crying. I'm going to give you something to cry about. I brought you in this world. And I take you out. What do you think is the source of these parenting practices? Master John, I don't want no trouble, sir. But Annabelle is my wife. She's the mother of my children. Sir, she don't want to share your bed no more. Please, sir. Now you listen here. Next time you come from me, taking this tone with me, we're going to line up all your children where they can see good. We're going to beat you half to death in front of them. Then I'm going to have my way with Annabelle every day till I get tired of her. Then I'm going to have my way with your daughters. Come front me, tell me what I was going to do. Use mine, ungrateful devil. We gon' beat your black behind. Before you stone me or my friends for our imperfections, consider that we may be rooted within a traumatic childhood, rooted within social disadvantage, rooted within centuries of oppression. How does one survive while colonized, commodified, cultural genocide, strangers in the struggle become allies. Allies become friends, and with friendship, we shifted the tides. It gave us drive, encouraged our art, empowered us with pride. Friendship gave us the audacity to stay alive. And now it's time to tell you the story of my friends. I was startled by gunshots from a painful slumber on the floor, drenched in sweat with symptoms of severe hypothermia. 
days and disoriented, I struggled to my feet and stumbled zombie-like into the living room. I witnessed my uncle aiming his gun, shooting at my father. I was frozen. Had my father just been killed by his own brother? My father survived, but we had to leave rapidly, intensely packing, packing. The packing triggered childish fears. (laughs) Got to move again. Another school change. No idea where I would end up. (laughs) And too sick to cry about it. We were packing up again. (laughs) And I was scared. Because every time we moved, I got hurt. My family never had much money. The closest thing we had to a deposit was a rain check. Therefore, in early 1997, my home became an imposing and stunning 10-story, grimy, dull brick building called the Auburn Family Reception Center, located in the Fort Greene neighborhood in the New York City borough, Brooklyn. The same Cumberland Hospital where Michael Jordan and Mike Tyson were born had become an emergency housing shelter for Mike Johnson. There I was, from the house my grandfather built to a homeless shelter with my comrades, casualties of American capitalism. I saw young mothers sleeping on the floor, nursing infants, ingesting disparities in the breast milk of their mommies. It was horrifying. But what really made me nervous, tomorrow was the first day at a new school, and I had no friends. The first day at PS 67, I sat in the back row. The classroom door opens, and in walks this 12 to 13-year-old kid floating in slow motion on a cloud of mystical smoke. His skin was a golden brown. He nonchalantly panned the room with his bright hazel eyes covered in fubu apparel. The students cleared a path for him. The girls' eyes fluttered. The boys nodded with pride and admiration. It was the grandest entrance I had ever seen. I turned to the girl next to me. I said, who is this kid? She said, oh, you talking about Deshaun? He the most popular kid in school. He like the prince of the projects. At lunchtime, I was in the far corner of the cafeteria sitting alone. The fog emerges from the floor again, and in walks Deshaun. He walked with an entourage of kids who should have definitely been in high school at the time. They walked straight towards me. He sizes me up a bit and says, Hey, yo, son, you in fifth grade, right? I'm Deshaun. These are my homeboys. I said, I am mom. I am Mike. I'm Micah. I'm from Florida. He said, hey, yo, son, you got a wild accent, B. You sound like a farmer, Mike. Fifth grade means you have Mr. Miranda after lunch. I could show you. Hey, yo, this kid here is Farmer Mike. We're going to take him to class. A small crowd followed as he escorted me to class. And just like that, I became a crew member. Homeboys with Deshaun, the prince of the projects. I would never eat lunch alone again. Mr. Miranda was a young Latino teacher with hope in his eyes. He had long, shiny, dark, silky hair kept in a ponytail. He was more than our teacher. He was our friend. His subject was math, but he also taught us character and artistic expression. There was an explosion of creativity in Fort Greene at that time. This Brooklyn Renaissance gave birth to Spike Lee, Erica Badu, Chris Rock, Most Deaf, Talib Kweli, Saul Williams, and so on. Mr. Miranda convinced us that we had the finest quality of art inside of us. Mr. Miranda used hip hop and Shakespeare to help us process our emotions. The story of Macbeth, like our own, so tragic, so beautiful, so gangster. In Fort Greene, our friendships were forged by our common struggle, anger, agony, and dream of redemption. We were counseled by crackheads drinking Old English, so we figured Shakespeare was just like us. And we were just as rough as Macduff. We, too, were casualties of the noble class's economic and political ambitions. Only when your friends and family have been killed and incarcerated can you truly understand what it was like for Macduff to come face to face with Macbeth, the symbol 
of his persecution. And in that Brooklyn ghetto far away from Shakespeare and 15th century England, imagining the moment when we could confront our oppressors and avenge our friends, we channeled the spirit of Macduff. I have no words. My voice is in my sword. Thou bloodier villain, than terms can give thee out. Despair thy charms, and let the demon whom thou still hath served tell thee. Macduff was from his mother's womb, untimely ripped. Then yield, be coward, and will you live to be the showing gaze of the time, and will have thee as our monsters are painted upon a pole and under it here may you see the tyrant mr miranda took us to the world's famous apollo theater in harlem for me it was a holy trip a sacred rites of passage it was surreal and sobering to rub that legendary tree at hope i had become a writer and a performer Right there on Frederick Douglass Boulevard, Deshaun promised me that one day I would tell our story and it would be liberating. The people would appreciate our art and be inspired by it. To practice, we played freestyle games. We could be anywhere, anytime. We would stop and immediately perform improvised rap poetry. How many years until that young boy grown? Left alone, tried to be strong, but never had no home. His faith is gone, but with his homies, he can do no wrong. Heart of stone, but Miranda tried to change that tone. Brooklyn's own homegrown showed me how to get in that zone. At a young age, jumped on the stage and processed that rage. Many days in Dade County, I was in that daze. The hate they gave, I was amazed by that Tupac phrase. Crime pays, rhyme pays, your only ways to escape that maze. I was raised in a blaze of drugs, violence, daddy in that cage. Just a craze on the slaves, decapitated in that grave. Deshaun tried to walk me home every day, but I had a morbid fear that the whole school would discover that I was homeless and I would no longer be worthy enough to hang out with the most popular kid in school. My daily homework was to convince Deshaun to let me walk him home, to avoid being exposed, humiliated, and losing my friend. One day on the way home, Deshaun abruptly stopped and said, Hey, yo, son, where's your building? I'm walking you home. Where's your spot, man? Ironically, where he stopped on the sidewalk was right in front of the entrance to the homeless shelter. I tried to change his mind, but he was committed. He would not be moved. It was 100% clear to me that this is the day Deshaun learns that I'm a bum. I'd be exposed to the entire school. They would torment me every day. I bowed my head in shame. I said, technically, you've walked me home every day. I live right here, motioning with my head toward the homeless shelter. Deshaun's eyes glared toward that towering structure. He said, oh man, word, Mike, you live here? I bowed my head even lower, humiliated, embarrassed, broken. Deshaun planted his feet, squared his shoulders, looked me directly in my eyes and said, we not gonna dish you, son. I will never diss you. Nobody is going to diss you. And in that instant, we were forever bonded on the deepest level of friendship. I'll never forget that experience. At my lowest and most vulnerable point, a child in an icy ghetto said those edifying words of compassion, mercy, 
humility, and pure gangster. And his promise was kept. No one ever said a word about the homeless shelter. Not even a single joke. I found happiness in a homeless shelter because of my teacher, Mr. Miranda, and my best friend, Deshaun. 24 years since that day, I still marvel at the quality of those childhood friendships. The best kind of friends, authentic, loyal, present, pure, honorable, and pleasant. That kind of friendship is empowering. It's life-saving. It represents the highest quality of love. There is so much we can learn from disadvantaged children. The quality of their character, the beauty in their art, and the power of their friendships. You never had a friend until you've bonded with one who can understand your lived experiences and the historical struggles of your family. You never had a friend until someone has loved you the same through your tragedies and your triumphs. You never had a friend until someone has encouraged your voice, believed in your dreams, and vowed that no matter what, they would never betray you. They would never harm you. They would never dish you. I pray you humanize the children who suffer from poverty. Invest in the places they live. Invest in their gifts. And invest in their friends.